Hello and welcome to this latest episode of Coping with COVID-19 podcast. Uh, my name is Michael Curran from the Ottawa Business Journal. Um, we're taking a little bit of a different approach today. We, uh, instead of having a guest, we're, I'm turning to two of my colleagues at the Ottawa Business Journal. Please uh, allow me to introduce them now. We have Peter Cavessi, one of our editors. Hello, Peter. Hi, Mike. And we have uh, David Solly. Hey, Dave, thanks for joining us. No problem, Mike. From your kitchen, it looks like? Yeah, that's where I am, right here in Scotland, in the home office. We're uh, we're all in uh, we're all in different uh, different positions here. I've been recording these things from my dining room table, and Peter, you're in uh, you're in our office actually. You're the only person holding holding fort. All all by myself, you know. At first, I was like, "Oh, it's so nice and quiet around here," and then I started to get uh, it's 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 a, it's a little it's a little spooky sometimes being uh, in an office tower and you when you know that you're the only occupant. Yeah, just don't start talking to yourself, Peter. Is my advice. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a problem if that starts happening. So anyway, what, what we want to do in this uh, brief podcast is just check in with a couple of our main editors uh, about some of the stories we've been covering uh, that are really resonating with our audience. Peter, we'll start with you. Um, when you think back over the past few days, what's been striking a chord with our audience? One of the most interesting stories that we've uh, published on obj.ca has been about co-working spaces. Uh, this has arguably, arguably been one of the, the hottest sectors, both in Ottawa and across North America over the last uh, few months or, or a year. Um, you've seen so many spring up across, uh, across Ottawa. And of course, the whole business model is based on having a bunch of people together in one space in somewhat close proximity, sharing ideas, collaborating, uh, having those sort of you know uh, happy collisions as uh, as it's often been been termed obviously like a lot of businesses uh here they've been forced to uh close their door but it really it's one of those sectors that when you started to to, to think about it you sort of start to wonder as we emerge from uh COVID-19 restrictions is there still going to be that same enthusiasm for uh, for uh, for that that model uh Dave you uh you you spoke to uh, to some of um uh, the uh, the operators of some co-working uh, spaces. What did uh, what did you hear from them? Well, uh, like basically, that's exactly right, Peter. Um, uh, there's um, let's say a lot of uh, anxious moments right now uh, for um, uh, for a lot of um, smaller independent co-working operators. I mean, you've got the big guys, uh, the Regis's, um, the Spaces, those type of companies. They're hurting. But the little guys uh, are really taking it on the chin right now. Um, so th this week I spoke to uh, a couple of operators. Uh, Trevor Clark, um, who runs head office Ottawa on Hazel Dean Road in Canada. Um, uh, and he uh, were, was one of them. And he uh, and his partner, they launched it about two years ago. Uh, they've got 15,000 square feet out there. Now, right now, I mean, they went from, he said, things were rocking and rolling in February. It was uh, the, the, the good times rolling. They were finally turning a profit. And then, bam, uh, COVID-19 hit. Businesses were forced to shut down. Physical distancing uh, comes in place. And right now, he says his revenues have, have dropped 80% uh, in the past month. Uh, there's still a couple of people popping in now and then to print off a few documents, whatnot. And he does have some permanent tenants who... We're still coming in every day, but but he relies heavily uh, on what a third of his business comes from meetings and seminars. Well, those aren't happening right now and probably aren't going to be happening anytime soon. And, and the problem is even when the social distancing and um, uh, measures are eased and businesses can open back up, really, uh, are you going to want to sit around with 100 of your closest friends in, in, a, in a small room and uh, listen to a seminar? So, uh, so there's a a bit of worry there, um, and um, the same uh, sentiment was echoed by uh, Meryl Rar, who over operates two co-working spaces in town. He shut them both down last month and um, says he doesn't know when he's going to open them up again. Now, there is some light uh, amidst all the gloom. I mean, um, uh, there are people who say that, um, that, that co-working spaces might find a niche once things start to open up. It's kind of a way to help companies reopen in stages in a safe way so that you may not want to invite everybody back into your main office. So then you might, uh, you know, consider um, letting some of your colleagues work from a co-working spot like Coworkly, 
uh, or head office Ottawa or, or work from home to kind of split things up. And, um, and, uh, and co-working spaces also, they're already looking at other ways of making money, devoting more space to, to dedicated private offices. And, um, and of course, they're gonna probably have to space out their desks a little more. Um, that could lead to more higher charges but at the same time, they're saying, uh, certainly Clark at least, that his, uh, his phone's already been ringing uh, with people who, uh, who, as he put it, are going nuts working at home and just want to get out of the house once the restrictions are lifted. So he's still, uh, he's still trying to maintain his sense of optimism. Yeah, uh, It's one of those sectors we're really going to have to take a close, uh, keep a close eye on. Yeah. I thought, you know, one of the points, Dave, just to jump in on that is, uh, you know, I thought Meher Arar's comment about, you know, really a little bit of dedicated office space, right? So it might be a matter of reconfiguring a lot of these spaces as, a, as opposed to them not being uh, relevant kind of in a, in a post-pandemic economy. The, the other silver lining, and, and maybe I'm being too much of an optimist on this, is, you know, I was wondering... Um, this 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 pandemic, of course, is going to put massive financial pressure on people, and some companies might rethink whether or not they need physical office space. Um, you know, everyone's working at home, and I think most companies are functional, at, at least kind of the B2B companies we typically deal with. So for sure, I think that idea of everybody being shoulder to shoulder in a tight space doesn't work. But also, people might also might say, "Well, we should rethink our office space and, and maybe have more a flexible working environment." So that could that could be a positive for them down the road. Yes, and that's exactly what they're banking on. Um, but at the same time, I mean, uh, uh, I believe a, a quote. I'm not sure I put it in the story, but one Amer um, Amer Amer a quote machine. He can really uh, really <laughs> put things in perspective. And he said, "It's going to be doomsday." Uh, the, 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 this this downturn is going to be doomsday for a lot of smaller co-working operators. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, get, I get that point too, right? If if you're dealing with the micropreneur that couldn't afford permanent office space to begin with, they might simply say, you know what, it was a little bit of a luxury to be in any type of office space, and I'm just going to continue working from home. So yeah. And Peter, um, th that's a great analysis of the of the co-working space. Anything else? stands out to you in the last few days from a from a either a, a COVID-19 perspective, Peter, or a more general local business perspective? I was just going to highlight the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the environment facing uh, the security guard firms, the, the providers of security uh, personnel. And, you know, I, I, I guess it really, really struck me when, um, you know, I, I did some shopping, right? When you go to the LCBO, all of a sudden now there's a security guard uh, there doing crowd control. Every single grocery store has a security guard there. So I sort of asked the question, well, what is the uh, what is the uh, the landscape like uh, for, for them? I mean, obviously they've lost a lot of business doing things like major events, uh, uh, doing like the big uh, the big sporting events. Um, but now all of a sudden there's these uh, these new markets uh, popping uh, popping up. Yeah, I think that's it's such a fascinating point that um, I think the more we've done this podcast and the more I read uh, our our um, coverage, it's hard to predict what companies are impacted and how. You know, just a, a quick example of that, I had three well-known restaurateurs on uh, earlier in the week, and um, each of them had a completely different story to tell, right? We had Atelier that said their decision was to shut down. Atelier is one of the, you know, most uh, prestigious uh, restaurants in the city. So yeah. they decided to shut down. Wolf Down, which is more that German street food uh, restaurant on Bank Street, so more fast food service, they decide to initially uh, continue, but ultimately their supply chain gets disrupted, so they have to go down to one day a week. And then on the opposite side, uh, you had the owner of, um, of uh, Evo, Greek Kitchen, and Maddie, both located on Preston Street, and he decides that he is going to launch a Greek grocery service because of his relationship with suppliers. So like those are three people that aren't even located more than let's say two or three kilometers away from each other, like basically the same part of town and three completely different stories within Ottawa's restaurant sector. It blows my mind that you can't be too presumptuous about who's, who are the winners and who are the losers in the pandemic economy. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you just never know. Uh, like I agree, where you're going to find uh, <laughs> where you're going to find a new niche that's just going to kind of crop up unexpectedly. Um, and I'll just uh, throw in another couple of companies I talked to this week uh, in the e-commerce uh, in, in the you know uh, space, not directly um, involved in the sense that they don't host e-commerce sites, but they cater to e-commerce platforms. Uh, one of them being Point 3D Commercial Imaging, which, um, which is a small company started by uh, this, uh, Spencer McPherson and his brother, um, two young guys here in the city, and they do um, they specialize in um, state of the art digital cameras that that create 3D virtual tours. So before all this happened, uh, all, 40 percent of their business came from retail. So you're thinking, you know, the, you know, you're thinking like hair salons, car dealerships, gyms, that kind of thing. All of those are closed. So you're thinking, wow, they're going to lose 40 percent of their business. But no, they didn't. They, they're, they're actually busier now than ever because the loss on the retail side has, more, has been more than made up by the gains they're making from from sectors like real estate and construction, where people can no longer actually tour your product, but they still want to see it. And they're still interested in buying it, whether it be um, looking around model homes in new home construction sites or, or, doing, uh, or, or, or doing virtual open houses on the resale market. So he says he can't keep up um, with the demand he's seeing right now. So that's, you know, that's another example of a business that, that, that kind of um, was able to uh, make, make uh, lemonade in a sense out of what could have been a lemon. Yeah. And, and what I wonder is, is as these new innovations do do come to market and, uh, you know, consumers become more familiar with them, is that going to lead to permanent changes in our behavior? Is that going to lead to a permanent shift in the market for companies uh, such as such as that? Are we are we going to I mean, obviously, right now, that's the only way to uh, in a lot of cases is to do these sorts of viewings is is the uh, the virtual route. Um, but uh, I'm curious if it is going to have a long lasting uh, impact on how these uh, how these industries uh, do do business. Well, listen, listen, guys. Thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate uh, both of you. You're you're you've been massively overloaded. Like a lot of businesses are suffering a bit of a downturn, but at the level of activity has gotten busier. So I thank both of you for keeping our uh, viewers um, and larger audience informed. Thanks for this. Just before we sign off, I wanted to mention uh, something coming up next week. We'll have uh, Mayor Jim Watson joining us on Friday. May 1st, and we're going to make that a live podcast and figure out a way where um, the local business community and OBJ uh, readers can pose questions to the mayor in a live format. Again, that's coming up on uh, uh, Friday, uh, May 1st, the first of the month. And certainly, I know one of the big issues will be uh, how we can get into a reopening phase, although we might not understand that completely. And the last thing I just wanted to mention, too, is that the video podcast is now available on SoundCloud. So people can go to soundcloud.com slash Ottawa Business Journal to listen to this in an audio format. Thanks again, Peter, for joining us. Thanks, Mike. And thank you, David. Keep up the great work. No problem, Mike. Thanks a lot. Hope Talk to see to you soon you. face to face. Yes, absolutely. In a real way, not this way. <laughs> Take care. You too.